Hello, folks. This is Pastor Mike Hoggard coming to you from Watchman Studios. Almost, but not quite live, with another Watchman video broadcast. Uh, where is the end of the world? Now, we know what the end of the world is. We know that uh, Christ is going to receive his people unto himself. He's going to gather the remnant of Israel. He is going to uh, allow the Antichrist and the false prophet and the image of the beast to reign over mankind for a certain period. And then Christ is going to come down, literally, Revelation 19, rule for 1,000 years. And I wouldn't, wouldn't surprise me one bit if it was to the second 1,000 years exactly. Satan's going to be in the pit during that time. And then after that, He's released for a little season. I don't get that, but it's God. So, like one last big hoot pushing against God. And that doesn't last long. Satan is then taken, cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet are. And there is the final judgment. That is the, and that everything dissolves. With the, every, the, Peter said in 2 Peter the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. So everything literally burn up and completely destroyed. Everything of the old world, the old heaven, the old universe, that's gone. That's the end of the world. Okay, That's sort of when the end of the world is. But another question to ask is where is the end of the world? And I have a reason for asking. I want you to take a look at the screen. This big red ship is actually a Russian ship. It's called Yamal. It is a nuclear powered, which means it doesn't run on diesel or anything like that. It's a nuclear powered icebreaker. It's got a very, very thick hull. It just amazes me that something like this floats, but, you know, when it's full of air, that's what it does. It's a nuclear-powered icebreaker that carries passengers. You can actually get a ticket to get on board this thing, and they will take you to the North Pole. They'll break all the ice with this ship from here, from, I guess, Russia to there. The, and it's named Yamal. It's named after the Russian word for the end of of the world, literally. The, and the reason why they call it that is what we've been talking about. The earth, which is the Bible describes as the dry land, ends. It ends uh, northern Canada, Greenland, Iceland, Denmark, Siberia, it ends there. Norway, I think. The earth lands end, they call it. And so beyond that, it's been given various names. We mentioned last week Hyperborea, Ultima Thule, and now here the Russian version of it called Yamal. We have this icebreaker, and it's called Yamal because it literally goes beyond the end of the earth to the North Pole, breaking the ice, and it takes passengers. So it reminds me of this. Deuteronomy 49, I'll put it up on the screen for you. The Lord shall bring a nation against thee from far, from the end of the earth, as swift as an eagle flieth, a nation whose tongue thou shalt not understand. Keep that in mind. We're going to see that again. A nation of fierce countenance, which shall not regard the person of the old, nor show favor to the young. Uh, if I keep reading, he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle. You know, let me stop right here. I heard when I was a, a boy about cattle mutilations. And it made big news. Nobody knew what was causing these cattle mutilations. Some suspected that there was, you know, Satan worship going on or witches or some sort of cult that was 
killing these cattle, draining all of the blood out of them, and I mean completely out of them. And the place where the dead cows were laying, there was absolutely no blood either in the cow itself or on the grass anywhere around it. So it wasn't bled out in the spot where they found it. The side of the mouth, sometimes the tongue, the eyes, surgically removed. In some cases, the cutting of the flesh was so precise that it cut between the cells itself. Nobody knows how to do it. Linda, um, Linda Howell, I think her name is, um, she basically got pulled into the whole UFO thing. She was an investigative reporter, and she went out, and uh, Linda Moulton Howe is her name. She went and investigated these cattle mutilations, and she talked to the farmers who had the cattle, and the farmers said, uh, this may sound crazy, but I'm telling you, the things that did it didn't come from this world. They came from outer space. That's what they told her. And so, now, do I believe that? I wouldn't accept, I know what the Bible says, that a nation of fierce countenance, whose tongue thou shalt not understand, he shall eat the fruit of thy cattle. And he'll come from the Yamal. He'll come from Hyperborea. He'll come from Ultima Thule. He'll come from wherever the earth ends, Beyond that, that's where he's coming from. And we obviously know that it has to be the North Pole because there's land on the South Pole. So it has to be the North Pole. Thus, all of these Nordic type alien creatures basically are the Northern Army. Let's look at several scriptures that will give us an understanding who these are, what their real intentions are. Remember Paula Harris who met Antaral. Antarel, it's got the name El in it from Elohim. El is God. Think about it. Um, he's 10 feet tall, blonde haired, blue eyed, fair complected, glowing, speaks a language nobody can understand. So these things are real. People see them, have seen them, and are continuing to see them. We've established from the Bible that it's absolutely allowable within the confines of the Bible. The Bible tells us about certain angels that we would not know the difference between us and them because of their appearance. So they look like men. So let's look at this northern army, these Nordic aliens, find out what they're up to. Deuteronomy 13, 6 is where we're going to start. If thy brother, the son of thy mother, or thy son, or thy daughter, or the wife of thy bosom, or thy friend, which is as thine own soul, entice thee secretly, saying, Let us go and serve other gods, which thou hast not known, thou nor thy fathers, namely of the gods of the people which are round about you, nigh unto thee, or far off from thee. Here it is from the one end of the earth even unto the other end of the earth. So it references where the earth ends beyond that point. That's where these gods come from. Verse 8, Thou shalt not consent unto him, nor hearken unto him, neither shall thine eye pity him, neither shalt thou spare, neither shalt thou conceal him. But thou shalt surely kill him. Thine hand shall be first upon him to put him to death. And afterwards the hand of the people, all the people. And thou shalt stone him with stones that he die because he has sought to thrust thee away from the Lord thy God, which brought thee up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. And all Israel shall hear and fear and shall do no more any such wickedness as this is among you. Now I want you to contemplate this for a minute. Here you have God with his people, and he loves his people. He loves them. He sent Jesus, his only begotten son, to them. 
So he loves them. But look at what he's telling them to do. He's telling them, got any kinfolk that are going after other gods that come from the end of the earth and beyond that, kill them. And he says, thy brother or thy son or the son of thy mother or thy son or thy daughter or the wife of thy bosom or thy friend, which is as thine own soul in ties thee secret. We're talking about, we're not talking about distant relatives. We're not talking about people that we don't know. We're talking about people that we love. God is absolutely serious about this. He says, if it's somebody, even if it's your own brand new wife, if she starts enticing you saying, let us go after, you know, the UFOs are coming. These ascended masters are going to come down. I believe that. Why don't you join with us? The court now, obviously we don't live in Old Testament times. And even though our constitution is based upon certain elements of God's law, we're not under this law. But when God was the one who was ruling over the Israelites in the wilderness, he made it absolutely plain that they were to not have any of their family members going out serving other gods that came from the end of the earth. God said, don't do it. And if you have somebody in your family that does it, you have an obligation. You have to kill them. Jesus said it this way. And I'm paraphrasing here, but anybody who loves their father, their mother, their son, their daughter, the wife, their sisters, their, their cousins, anybody, if you love them more than you love Jesus, you're not worthy to be his disciples. Not. Okay? So God, and, and why? Why is God so adamant about this? I'm telling you, it's because he knows them. And he knows what they're going to do to you. And he is trying to protect you and the rest of your family for falling into this. He's trying to do that. Um, Leviticus 19.31 Regard not them that have familiar spirits, neither seek after wizards to be defiled by them. I am the Lord your God. Leviticus 20 verse 6 And the soul that turneth after such as have familiar spirits and after wizards to go a-whoring after them, I will even set my face against that soul and will cut him off from among his people. Now these two verses have to deal with what we talked about last week. The fact that these Nordic aliens are really nothing more than familiar spirits or a type of familiar spirit. So, you know, I, I, people have said, you know, I, I asked some people at a church one time, do you believe in UFOs and aliens? No, I don't believe that people live on other planets. And I went, I don't either. I don't either. But what I believe is whether they're masquerading this way or this really is their appearance. They're appearing literally every day. There's somebody somewhere around the world that today saw a UFO. And in maybe in some cases they were able to film it, but they saw it. So we're talking about things that happen frequently and we now understand from the Bible what they are. They are familiar spirits. And God said, regard not them that have familiar spirits. So that's Stephen Greer. He's obviously got them. Paulo Harris, she's obviously got them. Uh, Colonel Corso, I mean, he writes his book. I believe what he says in his book. Uh, Tom DeLong, the Freemason rock star. I don't want to encourage you to do this. But if you feel like you can handle it, you might want to go look at the lyrics 
of some of the songs that Tom DeLonge has sung, both with Blink-182 and his current group, Angels and Airwaves. He's not a nice guy, I can tell you that. But these people all have familiar spirits. And God says, regard not them. Don't go chasing after them. Don't go along with their program. Hey, the aliens are going to give us warp drives. We're going to be able to go through worm wormholes from one planet to the next. We'll be able to go throughout the whole universe. Don't. Listen, space and astronauts and rockets and spaceships, they have always fascinated me. And I'm I feel like a little boy when I'm watching an old video of the space shuttle taking off or something like that. I mean, that's just me. I, and if anybody were to jump on this space bandwagon, I would do it in a heartbeat. If there had been a space force when I got out of high school, I might have joined up. Seriously. But we can't follow this stuff. We can't go chasing after that. God says, don't do it. They're, they've got, they're following after familiar spirits. Don't do it. Now, here is the, the northern army. And these verses I'm going to give you are either going to describe for us where the north is and what is so significant about it, what's going on there. And, of course, this northern army. I mentioned last week I had... Uh, Joel on the brain, and you're going to find out why. I, let's start in Isaiah 14, because remember what Lucifer said. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation, in the sides of the north, I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. And that last phrase is seven words. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. So, I mean, I've used this verse multiple times. But let's focus on exactly what he said in relation to these Nordic aliens. What he said was... Um, I will exalt my, in verse 13, I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north, which is the King James Bible way of saying on the north side. That's how we would say it. In the sides of the north is on the north side or the north face of it or whatever. All right. And we have, and we, we actually have in the Bible, a perfect example of what it is that Lucifer wants to conquer over in the north. I, uh, Psalm 48, 2. Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. So, we understand now. The devil doesn't just want to conquer a mountain and say, look, I own this mountain. See what I own? He's not just talking about that. He's talking about what is there at the mountain that on, in the sides of the north. And what is there? Beautiful for situation, the joy of the whole earth is, is Mount Zion on the sides of the north, the city of the great king. Mount Zion is, let me show you this in your King, our beloved King James Bible. Turn to Hebrews, and I'll try to put this on the screen for you. Uh, boy, I'd be lucky to find out where it is. But the Bible's talking about we are not come to a mountain that cannot be touched like at Mount Sinai. When God met Israel at Mount Sinai, all the people had to stay back away from the mountain. There was, God, Moses put big stones around the mountain to keep them and all the cattle away from the mountain because God said, if anybody unauthorized touches this mountain, I'll kill them. Wow. I mean, God is serious about his holiness and who comes in his presence. He allows Moses to be a mediator. But he doesn't want the Israelites because they're very full of sin and they cannot touch 
the mountain of God. Well, that mountain can't be touched. But Paul talks in Hebrew. I believe Paul wrote Hebrews. Paul talks in Hebrews about we are not come unto that mountain, but we are come to Mount Sion in heaven that can be touched because by the time we get there, we're going to be completely glorified. All right? So, you understand now, when he talks about the north, he's not necessarily just referencing what's at the North Pole. The north then goes beyond that up into the heavens. So where is this army coming from? Are they the Marine Corps? Are there going to be British special forces? Are there going to be Russian Spetsnaz? Are they going to be North Korean, Chinese? What are they going to be? I believe they're going to be way beyond all of those armies. You're going to have one third of the angels rebel and get kicked out of heaven. There's no telling how many scorpions are in the pit right now waiting to be released with the stinger of a scorpion on them. They're coming out. And in some cases, they're coming from exactly where God said, from the end of the earth, from the north country. So turn to Jeremiah chapter 1. God's going to explain it now. He tells Jeremiah to, you know, look at this pot, this seething pot. Somebody's got something in there stewing in there. This is what he says. Jeremiah 1, 13, the word of the Lord came unto me uh, a second time saying, what seest thou? And I said, I see a seething pot. And the face thereof is toward the north. Then the Lord said unto me, out of the north, and evil shall break forth upon all the inhabitants of the land. For lo, I will call all the families of the kingdoms of the north, saith the Lord, and they shall come, and they shall set every one his throne at the entering of the gates of Jerusalem, and against all the walls thereof round about, and against all the cities of Judah. Where is it? that when these entities come down from heaven, they don't go to, they're not looking to go to Washington, D.C. in the White House. Take, it, take me to your leader. They're not going to do that. They're going to establish thrones in Jerusalem. Why Jerusalem? Why that one? Why not Washington, D.C.? Or why not London? Why not Beijing? Why not Mumbai? Which is it? No, Delhi, the capital of India, one of the two. Why not Nairobi, Tokyo? Why not Hong Kong? Why not any of those places? No. They're going to meet and establish the thrones in Jerusalem. You know what they're going to do from there? They're going to rule over everybody on the face of the earth during that time. Which, if you think about it, it's a mockery of Jesus Christ. Because he's going to come down from heaven one of these days. He's going to establish his everlasting throne in Jerusalem and be there a thousand years. This army just has a few years, tops. Some say seven, some say three and a half. Whatever it is, I'm telling you, it's going to be a limited engagement. And then Jesus is going to come and say, excuse me, you're in my house. Amen. Jeremiah 4. Um, and all of this is telling us that there is an army coming from the end of the earth from the north, which is the heavens. Jeremiah 4, set up the standard toward Zion. Retire, stay not, for I will bring evil from the north. And a great destruction. Here it is. The lion has come up from his thicket 
and the destroyer of the Gentiles and is on his way. Stop right here. Who's the lion? Be sober. Be vigilant for your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion walketh to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. The destroyer of the whole Gentiles. It's coming from the north, right? Um, Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 1. O ye children of Benjamin, gather yourselves to flee out of the midst of Jerusalem and blow the trumpet in Tekoa. Set up a sign of fire in beth Hacharim, for evil appeareth out of the north and great destruction. And here's, here's what really gets me. Um, 2 Thessalonians, actually, yeah, 2 Thessalonians. All of these people believe that the Nordic aliens are benevolent. That means they're the good guys. Now, they understand, and the way UFOologists think, they think that there's multiple races of aliens, which there are, there are multiple species of the angelic realm, even the evil ones. And um, they think that because these Nordics look like us and they have bright, glowing, happy faces and they're very handsome people, that they're going to be our friends. Even the gray aliens, they're going to be our friends here. They're going to be, they're going to help us. They're, we're going to evolve and they're going to help us do that. In fact, they said, you want to become gods? Yes. Well, then allow us to mingle with your seed. And then you will be gods. Are you catching that, people? But the Bible says they're going to turn on them. They're going to be an evil nation, a bitter nation, a hasty nation, a destroying nation. Uh, Jeremiah 6, verse 22. And I want you to, th as I read this verse, I want you to think for a minute. You know, in the United States Army, we still have what is referred to as a cavalry, not cavalry, cavalry. And what that means is a division of soldiers that ride on horses. Okay, they come charging in on horses. They got a sword in their hand or maybe a pistol. All right. But we don't really have army men who ride horses in the battle anymore. We don't do that. We have tanks, got Jeeps, got Humvees, got armored vehicles of various types. But I don't remember in Vietnam or Iraq or Iraq again. I don't remember any military uh, engagement of the enemy where our guys were all riding on horseback. Do you? No. So we, we got we to gotta believe the Bible. We look at Jeremiah chapter 6, verse 22, and look at what it says. It says, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, a people shall come from the north country. These are the Nordics. And a great nation shall be raised from the sides of the earth. Now look at verse 23. They shall lay hold on bow and spear. Let me keep reading. They are cruel and have no mercy. Their voice roareth like the sea, and they ride upon horses set in array as men for war against thee, O daughter of Zion. We have heard the fame thereof. Our hands wax feeble. Anguish hath taken hold of us, and pain as of a woman in travail. That, that links with 1 Thessalonians 1, or 5. And go not forth into the field, nor walk by the way, for the sword of the enemy and fear is on every side. Oh, there's so much here. The fact that, uh, that when this happens, pangs are going to take over people as a woman in travail. Bum, bum, bum. What is that? That is directly related to 1 Thessalonians 
5, For the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night, for when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail upon a woman with child. So if you're marking things in your Bible, mark uh, 1 Thessalonians 5, verse 3, next to Jeremiah chapter 6, verses 22 through 25, and then write Jeremiah 6, 22 through 25 over here in 1 Thessalonians 5. And you might write Isaiah 13 in as well. Any place, any place where you have a, a child that's going to be born and the woman's in travail. Think about Ichabod. Phineas's, Phineas was an evil jerk who deserved to get killed. Okay? Anyway, he gets killed, but his wife's going to have a baby. And the baby is born. The woman travailed in birth. The waters broke forth. He was rose up out of the sea of the waters that was in her. By the way, the uterine water that's around this, the uh, birth sac, it's salt water just like the ocean. Yeah, you're little, we were all little beasts rising up out of the sea is what we were. Anyway, man, I could spend time on this. So they come out of the north country. They're holding bows and spears. Who does that anymore? No one. I don't even know that they put bayonets on the end of soldiers' rifles anymore. Maybe they carry them someplace. I don't know. But typically, we don't fight wars with swords and bayonets and big axes and big swinging maces with spikes. We, do, we just don't fight people that way. This army's coming, and they're coming with bow and spear. Do you believe your Bible? I do. And if the Bible says that in a future time they're coming with bow and spear, they are. So why would we have to be afraid of that? I mean, a lot of us here in this country, we've got semi-automatic rifles. Somebody comes at us with a, with a sword and a spear, we just start shooting rounds in them until they don't come after us anymore. But these, bow, these bows and spears are different. They're a lot more powerful than the ones that we can make here. Very powerful. The Indians made them out of straight sticks and sharpened stones. Why, we've got these graphite rods, composite maybe, with razor sharp blades on them. But these, this army is coming with bows and spears and I guarantee you, you don't have a defense against it. Not at all. If these, if these gods, little g, are more powerful than you are, you're not going to win. Won't happen. Uh, what else was there? They roareth like a sea. They ride upon horses. Again, they ride upon horses. Who does that? No one. But it says that they set in array men for war against the O daughter of Zion, and all of a sudden they just took over using bows and spears and arrows. And yet they won. Because I got a feeling their arrows are way more powerful than ours. I have a feeling, I almost guarantee you, they are knowing where they come from. That's, that's my thing. So w when you go back and read the story of Gog and Magog in Ezekiel 38 and 39, these are spirit devils that are an army on this earth and they have weapons and they come riding on horses, right? But who fights like that is? So we know it's not the Germans, not the Russians. It's a different army from a different place, the end of the earth. Jeremiah 10, 22. Behold, the noise of the brute is come. A brute is a beast. 
and a great commotion out of the north country to make the cities of Judah desolate and a den of dragons. So this northern army is going to come looking fair, complected, blue eyes, blonde hair, beautiful specimens, right? All the ladies are looking at the Nordic blonde young men and they're going, yeah, I take that. And all the guys are looking at the female ones and all the guys are going, did you see that chick? Whoa. They're going to mingle themselves with the seed of men, people. Jeremiah 50 verse 3. For out of the north there shall come up a nation against her, which shall make her land desolate, and none shall dwell therein. They shall remove, they shall depart, both man and beast. And then we skip down to verse 9, same chapter. For lo, I will raise and cause to come up against Babylon an assembly of great nations from the north country. And they shall set themselves in array against her from thence, she shall be taken, their arrows, there they are again, their arrows shall be as of a mighty expert man, none shall return in vain. They shoot arrows. Well, and here's, here's the scholars. Well, John didn't know what a tank was, what an automatic machine gun was. He didn't even know the idea of a bullet. I mean, what do you do with a bullet? It's just a piece of lead, right? Okay. And if I throw a bullet at somebody, it's not going to kill them. It may not even hurt them. So how is it launching a little ball of lead out? They don't understand. And so they just wrote down, you know, bows and spears because that's what they understood. No, I don't believe that for a minute because remember, these words are not Jeremiah's words. They're God's. God just said, Jeremiah, open your mouth and I'll put my words in your mouth and you consume that. And then you write down everything I said. And that is exactly, it didn't come from Jeremiah and his limited knowledge came from God. Jeremiah 50 verse 41, behold, a people shall come from the north and a great nation and many kings shall be raised up from the coasts of the earth down to verse 48 then the heavens and the earth and all that is therein shall sing for babylon for the spoilers shall come unto her from the north saith the lord you know what spoiling is don't you you put things in the refrigerator leftover food from supper leftover food from the chinese restaurant or bread or bologna, or cheese, or any kind of whatever meat you eat, you put it in the refrigerator, and you forget about it, right? You go back a couple months later, and there's mold and rot growing all over it. Ugh! And some kind of ooze is oozing out of it. Honey, is this any good? No, it's spoiled. And we use that term that way, and what it means is when an army defeated another army, they got to pick up their swords, their shields, whatever gold they had on, whatever food they had, to the victor go the spoils is the statement. And that's what this northern army is going to do. They're going to come here. And they're going to take whatever they want. You say, what, well, they're spirits. What do they need? You know, that's something I'm studying and I don't understand it yet. I know for a fact from Ezekiel uh, 28 that Satan loves merchandise and he loves to traffic merchandise to get money out of it. Now, it's possible that God designed him that way. What kind of bird is it, I'm trying to think, that likes to take shiny like people's jewelry and put it in their nest, right? So there's always an earthly example of this somehow, some way. But I am convinced that the devil loves stuff.
stuff, things of this world, merchandise, and he loves to traffic in it. Okay? So these, this nation is going to come down and they're going to take whatever they want to take. They're going to spoil the whole earth. Ezekiel 8 verse 3, And he put forth the form of an ant and took me by a lock of my head. This is when God is showing Ezekiel what was going on in the temple. And the Spirit lifted me up between the earth and the heaven, and he brought me in the visions of God to Jerusalem to the door of the inner gate that looketh toward the north, where was the seat of the image of jealousy, which provoketh to jealousy. And behold, the glory of the God of Israel was there, according to the vision that I saw in the plain. Then he said unto me, Son of man, lift up now thine eyes now toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, the image of jealousy in the entry. Remember what Satan said. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also in the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. So you compare that with this. And here is sort of a, a like a prophetic picture of it. Where they took an image of jealousy, an idol. And they set it on the north side. Now let me tell you a little bit about the temple and the tabernacle. God told Moses not only how to build it, but how to set it up. And when they set it up, the entryway was to be facing direct east. The most holy place would be in the west. To the south was the candlestick, the seven candlesticks, which are the seven spirits of God. But on the right side, which is the north, was just a table. It was overlaid with gold, but there really wasn't anything fancy about it. It was just a plain table. And on that table, every day, 12 freshly baked loaves of bread. Somebody got up early in the morning, baked the showbread, and brought it over, set it in the house of the Lord while it was fresh that day. Okay? So, if we were to, and then, then of course we have the, the, uh, the Ark of the Covenant. So if we were to compare that, we know that the Ark of the Covenant represents God the Father, that's His throne. The candlestick represents the Holy Spirit. What's the table represent? And the bread, Jesus. On the bread that came down from heaven is what he said. So think about this now. We have an image of jealousy, and where is it sitting? It's sitting in the exact same place in the north where Jesus. Psalm 23. Thou preparest a table before me, in the presence of mine enemies. Wow. On the north side. And here's, as Ezekiel is looking in the temple, in the side of the north, they replaced Jesus with an image that provoked God to jealousy because in Genesis chapter 9, he ended up killing almost everybody in town. With the exception of those whom God knew their heart was toward God's house. Mm-mm-mm. Well, I, if this is the first time you've ever listened to anything I've ever said, you might be getting the idea that God's a really, really ticked off God and he's just looking to pounce on somebody. No, it's actually not true. Ezekiel 33 says that God gets no pleasure in the death of the wicked. The Bible says that God wants all men to come to repentance. God wants everybody to be saved. He sent His only begotten Son to die for the sins of the whole world. No matter how bad they were. No matter how bad you were. So I just want to kind of clear that up. A lot of verses here that I've been reading shows the wrath of God, and he does have it. But that wrath can be appeased by his son, Jesus Christ, who is standing there on behalf 
of you and me to bear our petitions before God. Oh, I love that. Then, then, after he sees the image of jealousy on the north side, God takes him one more step. Ezekiel 8, verse 14. Then he brought me to the door of the gate of the Lord's house, which was toward the north. And behold, there were sat women weeping for Tammuz. If you look back in verse 5, Then said he, Son of man, lift up thine eyes the way, the way toward the north. So I lifted up my eyes the way toward the north, and behold, northward at the gate of the altar, this image of jealousy in the entry. You know who Tammuz is? Tammuz, Tammuz, however you pronounce it. Tammuz. He is the Antichrist, basically. Uh, traditionally, he is the offspring of, get ready for this, King Nimrod from Genesis 10, the first king of Babel, and his mommy, Semiramis. Semiramis, Semiramis, however you pronounce it. Yeah, now, probably wasn't his birth mommy. It was probably the wife of his father. But Nimrod thought, man, she's hot. I don't know if I can keep my hands off her or not. And she's like, go ahead. Okay, your dad's dead. I'm all alone. I've been, I've been very lonely, Nimrod. You know how that's played out, right? So they got together and had a baby. Named him Tammuz. Tammuz is all throughout. He's different, takes different forms like Quetzalcoatl and Bacchus and Dionysus and Apollo. All of these gods died a sacrificial death for the benefit of their people. They are mockeries of Jesus Christ. Every one of them. So Tammuz is an antichrist. Apollo's an antichrist. Um, who else? Bacchus, Dionysus. These are all antichrist spirits, images. Just wait for the real antichrist to show up. He's going to do... Now, while not everybody in the world is a Buddhist, not everybody in the world uh, is a Muslim, but I guarantee you there's coming a day when everybody in the world, their religion is they're going to be worshiping this beast or his image. Guaranteed. And where are they, where are they facing? The north, weeping for Tammuz. Because they thought that's where he's going to come from when he comes back. Um, Joel chapter 2. I told you I was going to get into Joel. Joel chapter 2, I'll never forget this, several years ago, quite a few years ago, listening to Christian radio and hearing people talk about Joel's army and how Joel's army was great and Joel's army was God's great army. Joel's army is the army that God's going to use to, to whoop up the world beat everybody up, kill everybody that stands in our way, and when we've killed all the evildoers, then we've got the kingdom, but we're not going to keep it. We're going to hand it to Jesus Christ. But we have to be Joel's army first. You know what Todd Bentley calls Joel's army? The new breed. And Bentley, who's wacko, 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 anyway, with his mistress who turned into his wife call it like that because that's who she is she's baddie like he is but he has a picture he shows his tattoos he's got dog tags that identify him with joel's army and he says to everybody we're the new breed a new breed is an altered dna so, all of these false prophets promoting Joel's army. We're the mighty army of God. We're Joel's army. 
So I went to Joel and I started looking in Joel and I saw that Joel's army has cheek teeth of a lion. Well, in Revelation 9, that devils that come up out of the pit, they got cheek teeth of a lion. I noticed that their movement sounded like the rushing of many chariots in Joel. Well, I look back in Genesis 9, sure enough, that's what they sound like. And one thing after another, you can plainly see the description of Joel's army in Joel matches perfectly the description of the devils that are raised up out of the pit in Genesis, uh, Revelation chapter 9. And for these people to say, yep, we're part of that. You know what? I believe them. But I'll never follow them. And neither should you. So, Joel chapter 2, if you look like in verse 4 of chapter 1, that which the palmer worm hath left, palmer worm has the locust eaten, that which the locust has left hath the canker worm eaten, that which the canker worm hath left the caterpillar eaten. Four. So we know these are spiritual worms. Caterpillars, um, locusts, palmer worms, canker worms. These are all worm creatures that, what do they do? They devour vegetation. And they don't care what it is. They don't care if it's your farm. They're going to devour it. The worm's going to get it. But this is a different type of worm. Totally different. Because when this worm transforms into what they're really going to look like, it's going to be awful. Totally awful. So you study Joel chapter 2. It's not much here. Or Joel, the entire book. I think it's only uh, three chapters. It won't take long. But you'll see what that northern army, you'll see what these Nordic aliens are. So I'll read Joel chapter 2 verse 20. But I will remove far off from you the northern army and will drive him into a land barren and desolate with his face toward the east sea and his hinder part toward the utmost sea and his stink shall come up and his ill savor shall come up because he has done great things. Great things. Like, and when he says great, the Latin word would be magnum, magnus. It doesn't mean Wow, that's really great. I'm so proud of you. You got, you got an A on your test. That's great. doesn't mean it that way. It means a large volume of things that they did. And they were all bad, all evil. And the people that they were done to, if they lived through it, they wouldn't be saying, boy, that was great. I want another one of those. They wouldn't do that. Okay? Now, let me introduce to you a woman. Her name is Trisha McCannon. I happened upon her a few years ago and I made notes on some of her videos and I when I was researching these Nordic aliens, I you know, I'll go to my Evernotes cuz I'm going, maybe I put some notes in there that I think you know, at the time would have been beneficial. So I'm going through all my notes on Nordic and the northern, you know, country, the north country, things like that. I'm doing my research on things that people have sent me. And this one got my attention. Member of the Theosophical Society. Stop, stop. Do you know who that is? That was Helena Blavatsky's organization. She started it along with some other people. She had Crowley in it for a while. He split off. She had Elise Bailey in there, I think. Maybe, I don't think it was Annie Besant. But she had several people in there. And they all wrote books about the occult and about how we're, the Ascended Masters are going to come down and help us one of these days. Well, she believes that. So she's giving a talk. She's from the Atlanta area. and She's giving a talk. She's a member of the Theosophical Society who, who serve and believe in spirit guides they call the Great White Brotherhood. You remember that from last week? 
because she's, Blavatsky's dead, been dead for a long time. Crowley's been dead for a long time. Uh, Jack Parsons and, and L. Ron Hubbard, who were disciples of Crowley, they both kind of split up and went different ways. And Jack Parsons went on to be, he was a rocket scientist, but he was doing some wacky, wacky, wacky stuff. He ended up blowing himself up and in a bad experiment. You have L. Ron Hubbard, who starts the, the cult of Scientology, Tom Cruise, who's like their spokesman. And these people are wicked, but all of these have passed away. So we have a new group of people belonging to the Theosophical Society that Blavatsky started. And here's some of the things that she's done. Some of the books and DVDs. One of them is Atlantis discovered the lost civilization around the world. Portal to Ascension. Uh, Jesus, the explosive story of the 30 lost years in the ancient mystery religions. L let me stop right here for a minute and kind of chase that rabbit. Because I know what that means. You read the Bible. Okay? And, and when you study patterns like I do, even if I don't understand them, I study them. I know that I'm in the four gospel area. There's the first page of Matthew. I know that there's four of these gospels. Two of them never say a word about Jesus' birth. Not a word. Mark and John. Luke and Matthew say lots of words about Jesus' birth, okay? But they still tell the whole of the story of Jesus' life with the exception. Once they talk about the birth of Christ, I think it's only Luke that gives us the story of what happened when Jesus was 12. Remember, he was in the temple astounding everybody with his knowledge. They were blown away, but they, were, they didn't know. Can you imagine that? They were talking to God and didn't know it. Whew. What, a, what a missed opportunity that was. But anyway, after that encounter, the Bible, we have nothing after Jesus was 12, we have nothing until he's 30 years old. Okay? What is that, 18 years? Yeah. The speculation is, and this is where people like Trisha Cannon, McCannon, and others, they want to say that Jesus, after that he was 12 years old, took off went to India and he learned mystery ideas, cult ideologies. He learned how to meditate. He, learned to, he probably learned how to levitate. That's what they say. They make that up and there is absolutely zero evidence that that ever happened. So where does Trisha McCannon get her knowledge of the things that Jesus did before he was 30 years old. Where do you think she got that? Did she get it from the National Enquirer? No. Did she get it from a, a drama documentary on the History Channel? No. She was told by devils what Jesus did in the time he was 12 to the time he was 30. Devils, familiar spirits told her information. And do we trust that? Not on your life.